Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Welcome to our third of six webinars that we will be featuring here at the National Museum of the Pacific War, paying tribute to the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. I'm your host, Jeff Copsetta, and I am joined today by Dr. H.W. Brands. Dr. Brands is a published author, published many times, and he is going to discuss today FDR and the end of World War II. So, Dr. Brands, thanks for joining us, and welcome. Delighted to be with you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to our virtual audience today. It's quite a pleasure to do anything connected with the National Museum of the Pacific War, which, of course, is one of the, the great institutions dealing with World War II in the United States or anywhere around the world. It just so happens that the, the end of World War II is particularly timely with me. I teach at the University of Texas, but as many of you will know, we're not meeting in class these days. So it's a virtual lecture hall and we're talking about World War II. We're kind of, it's, a, it's a course that tries to get us up to the present. We're about 75 years from the present, so we've got a lot of ground to cover between now and the end of the semester. But it gives me a chance to think about and to talk about Franklin Roosevelt and the end of World War II. Now, when I talk about it in class, it's Franklin Roosevelt and, of course, Harry Truman and the end of World War II. But, but the, the way the war ends is really uh, essential to the way the world has been ever since. And there was no president who was better prepared to deal with the end of World War II than Franklin Roosevelt was in the mid-1940s. And this for the reason that Franklin Roosevelt was one of that very rare examples in the American presidency of someone who had good reason to believe at a much earlier age that he might actually become president one day. I put the question to my students. So who are the, I, I say that there are two presidents who knew from an early age that they, might, they had a good chance to be president of the United States. And one was John Quincy Adams because his father was president. And the other was Franklin Roosevelt because his uncle was president. So partly because his uncle had been president, Franklin Roosevelt became assistant secretary of the Navy during World War I. And this is absolutely crucial to understanding how Roosevelt foresaw the end of World War II. Because he saw how his boss in World War I, Woodrow Wilson, didn't, and how it didn't turn out well. Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, had a ringside seat in Wilson's administration. And he saw that what had caused Wilson to want to go into the war was for the United States to get a seat at the peacemaking table. For Wilson, and this is going to be true of Roosevelt himself when he becomes president, for Wilson, the point of going into war was to be able to shape the peace. Because Wilson understood that war is not what Americans identify themselves with. For the United States, war is this anomaly. It's this unusual thing. America goes to war when it has to, but it's always trying to figure out how to get to the peace and how to make the peace stick. There is a feature in the American character. You can call it naive if you want to. You can call it charming, appealing. And that is Americans tend to think that war is unusual in international affairs. Peace is the norm. And for most Americans, they would much rather the country be at peace, the world be at peace, and they can go about their own business. Now, uh, the world often doesn't work that way. So Franklin Roosevelt gets this chance in World War I to look at how Wilson leads the United States into war, but more importantly, how Wilson leads the United States out of World War I. For Wilson, the goal of the war, the model for keeping the peace afterwards, is an international organization. In Wilson's day, it's called the League of Nations. And the whole idea of the League of Nations is to create an international body that can adjudicate disputes among nations so that they don't have to go to war to resolve the differences that they have. Wilson, who was a lawyer by training and a political scientist by profession, recognized that the reason countries go to war is precisely that there is no higher body to which they can take their disputes. If you and I get in a dispute in a domestic circumstance, we can go to court. If I commit a crime against you, I can be prosecuted by the police, but you don't get to come back and whack me over the head to settle it yourself. The problem with the international arena is that that's exactly the way countries operated. Each one was um, a power unto itself. The nations were technically speaking outlaws one to the other. 
And what Wilson wanted to do at the end of World War I was to create an international organization so that they would not be outlaws one to the other. So Franklin Roosevelt watched, he learned. He learned what Wilson's ideas were all about. He learned the advantages of this international approach, this internationalist approach to world affairs. He ran for, well, he ran on the presidential ticket in, of the Democrats in 1920 with James Cox. And although they lost, they ran, well, actually one of the reasons they lost is that they ran as internationalists. They defended Wilson's idea of the League of Nations at a time when the League of Nations was becoming unpopular with the American people. So Roosevelt learned a couple of things out of this lesson. One is that the American people have to be sold on the idea of internationalism, of relinquishing a certain amount of American sovereignty to an international body, whether it's called the League of Nations, which the United States did not join, or its successor, which the United States would join. In fact, the United States would sponsor the successor to the League of Nations, the United Nations. So Franklin and Roosevelt understood there were political costs to getting too far out front of the American people on this subject. But nonetheless, he held in the back of his mind this ideal, should there be another war? I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna make very clear that this war wasn't my idea alone. Woodrow Wilson was often criticized during the war and after for leading the United States into a war it didn't have to go into. And so the critics of Wilson and of World War II, and there were many during the 1920s and 1930s, called it Mr. Wilson's War. Roosevelt watched, listened, understood, and made a mental note, if I ever get in this position, I'm gonna make sure that doesn't happen on my watch. The second thing is that Roosevelt wanted to ensure that should there be another war, and in fact, through the 1920s and 1930s, it was increasingly clear to pretty much everybody who was interested that there was going to be another war because World War I did not resolve the disputes that had given rise to the, given rise to the war. So Roosevelt, he's gonna be careful about his international approach to things, and nonetheless, that is going to guide his policy during the war. Okay, so Roosevelt gets elected president in 1932. And his election as president in 1932 had nothing to do with international affairs. It had everything to do with the depression at home. Roosevelt understood that the depression was not simply an American phenomenon. It was something that countries around the world were experiencing. And he understood there was an international dimension to it, the collapse of trade had given rise to the depression, had contributed to it. But nonetheless, he recognized that Americans wanted to focus on what was going on in the United States first. So he did this and he said nothing about international affairs to speak of during his first term. During his second term, as Asia went to war, as Japan attacked China, starting a regular war and then the invasion and occupation of China in 1937, Roosevelt watched and he believed that the United States was probably going to get dragged into that war sooner or later. But it was absolutely crucial for Roosevelt that the US get dragged in later rather than sooner. The US was going to be dragged into the war. He was not gonna lead the United States into the war. Roosevelt watched what was going on in Europe at the same time. The Nazi regime in Germany was overthrowing the articles of the Treaty of Versailles that specified that Germany was supposed to be disarmed and it wasn't gonna build up a war machine again. And, and Hitler tore up those clauses and began rebuilding Germany's war machine. And he recognized that Germany posed a grave threat to the United States, to democracy. He remembered, Roosevelt remembered, when Wilson, in asking for declaration of war in 1917, had said that the world must be made safe for democracy. Roosevelt was too canny to repeat those words because he knew that Wilson had fallen into unpopularity. So he wasn't going to do that. But that's exactly what Roosevelt believed. And so he figured that the United States could not avoid participation in this war. The United States would get involved in the war in the Pacific. The United States would get involved in the war in Europe. There was really no avoiding. The only question was how and under what terms the United States would be involved. Roosevelt did his best to keep the United States away as long as possible. He didn't want to be criticized the way Wilson had been for leading the United States prematurely into the war. And it was this that really eventually led to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt 
put the politics, excuse me, put the economic screws and the political screws to Japan to try to get Japan to get out of, first of all, Indonesia, which it had subsequently invaded, and then out of China. He cut off supplies of oil and scrap steel to Japan. He knew that the Japanese military machine could not survive without this. Roosevelt effectively declared economic war on Japan before the Japanese attacked at Pearl Harbor. The Japanese knew perfectly well what Roosevelt was doing. The American people didn't quite know what Roosevelt was doing because Roosevelt didn't lead with this. He didn't say, I'm trying to go to war with Japan. But in fact, this is what Roosevelt needed. This is what Roosevelt wanted. He, he wanted the United States to get involved in the war. So he wasn't surprised that the Japanese attacked the United States in December 1941. He was, he was surprised. He was flabbergasted that the attack came at Pearl Harbor. So later notions that there was this conspiracy that Roosevelt knew that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor and let the ships get sunk anyway. No, no, that's quite, that's quite wrong. Roosevelt did expect a Japanese attack in perhaps the Philippines, in, on the approaches to the Dutch East Indies, not Pearl Harbor, but nonetheless, because the Japanese attacked the United States, Roosevelt was in a position to co contrast himself to Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson had led the United States into war. Roosevelt had arranged it so the United States would be dragged into the war. The, Amer the American people had no alternative to supporting a war against Japan, because after all, the United States had been attacked. Until December 6th, 1941, the isolationist element in American politics was still very strong. There were important and large groups who said the United States needs to sit this one out. We didn't get anything good out of World War I, so we're going to sit out World War II. Roosevelt recognized that this was an important political force. It had something to do, of course, with the fact that Roosevelt wanted to and did get uh, reelected a second time, that is, elected a third time in 1940. He wanted to make sure that America's potential allies not lose the war before the United States got in, but he wanted to make sure that it was very clear that the United States had been attacked. Now, there was a moment, in fact, there were about 48 hours after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and before the German declaration of war against the United States, where Roosevelt wondered if somehow the United States had gotten in the wrong war. Because Roosevelt believed, and this is essential to understanding his Pacific policy, Roosevelt believed that Germany was by far the greater threat to the United States than Japan was, or to put it otherwise. If the United States emphasized defeating Japan first, Germany would be stronger than ever after the United States cleaned things up in the Pacific because Germany would continue to gain power. If, on the other hand, the United States dealt with Germany first, Japan had pretty much reached its maximum expansionary extent. So Japan without Germany would be not easy to finish off, but it would be straightforward. Germany without Japan would be as strong as ever. So, so Germany, though, solves Roosevelt's problem by declaring war on the United States. It's a, the perfect scenario for Roosevelt, who is already thinking about how this war is going to end. Roosevelt had no doubt that the United States would defeat the Axis powers. The United States would defeat Germany. The United States would defeat Japan. It was not going to be easy. It, was, it might even be a long war, although it turned out to be relatively short as American wars went. But it was something that was going to happen. And he knew this because the productive capacity of the American economy was far greater than the productive capacity of any other country. That Americans had more of the stuff required to fight a modern war than Germany and Japan did. And it was really a matter of getting that stuff, and of course, getting American soldiers into a position where they could employ America's greater economic might. It took over two years to really come to grips with Hitler and the Germans in Europe. And the big push didn't come until the spring of 1944. So this is two and a half years after the war has begun. And it takes that long for the United States to mobilize and really get ready to go. Meanwhile, of course, American forces in the Pacific have held the line against Japanese expansion and have begun, have begun to push back. But that's not the emphasis in American war strategy. The emphasis is on, on focusing on Europe first, and then we will deal with what is happening in the Pacific. So the war proceeds more or less as expected after the summer of 1944. American forces invade Germany at the beginning of 1945, and they close in on Hitler and the Nazi regime. 
Roosevelt by this time has been elected a fourth time. He was elected in, again in November 1944. Roosevelt at that point, and, and this is really crucial to understanding Roosevelt's view of the end of the war and how the war actually ends. Roosevelt knew that he was a sick man when he ran for re-election again in 1944. He, now, he wasn't in a position where he knew he was going to die just a few months after being inaugurated in 1945, but he knew there was a reasonably good chance that he might. He persuaded his physician to essentially perjure himself and to give Roosevelt a clean bill of health, at least a far cleaner bill of health than was actually the case. But Roosevelt's thinking on this was essentially, I have given the order, I as commander in chief and commander in chief have given the order to millions of Americans that they are going to put their lives on the line for the American war effort against the Axis powers. I, as president, I as commander in chief can put my own life on the line if I die as president amid the war, you know, if, we, if I can just get to the end of the war, then I will have accomplished the purpose. So this is Roosevelt's thinking. Under any other circumstances, it would have been quite irresponsible for Roosevelt to run for president as sick as he was in 1944, but there was a war on. And did he believe he was gonna make it to 1948 to the end of his fourth term? Probably not. In fact, of course it turned out that he did. But he saw that the end of the war was coming and he had he had a couple of ideas and he had some notions as to how the war was end, gonna end and how he was gonna end it. So during the war, Roosevelt had developed a personal relationship with the leader of Great Britain, Winston Churchill, and the leader of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin. The three met on a number of occasions during the war for these wartime summits. And Roosevelt believed that he had come to understand Churchill with whom he developed, I won't call it exactly a cordial relationship, but certainly a, a personal relationship. Roosevelt recognized that the interests of the United States were by no means identical to the interests of the British Empire. In fact, Roosevelt and Churchill often had arguments that Churchill was being way too much the imperialist. But Churchill told Roosevelt, let's well, actually shut up on that. That's none of your business, at least during the war. So Roosevelt basically backed off. He had meetings with Stalin. Roosevelt recognized that Churchill he, Roosevelt, and Stalin were gonna write the rules of the road for the post-war period. These were the ones who were gonna lead the great powers, the, the Grand Alliance to victory, and they were the ones who were gonna dictate the peace. And so Roosevelt believed that it was important to capitalize on the personal relationship that he had developed with Churchill and with Stalin. Now, little did he realize that he wouldn't make it to the end of the war, nor did he realize that Churchill would quite make it to the peace. Churchill made it to the end of the war in Europe. He didn't quite make it to the end of the war in the Pacific. He was voted out of office. But anyway, so Roosevelt has this personal stake in the outcome of the war. And secondly, he's already thinking, how is the world gonna look after the war? He believes number one, that there needs to be created an international organization, an updated and critically renamed version of the League of Nations. The idea of an internationalist end to the war, an internationalist basis for the post-war peace settlement was absolutely crucial in Roosevelt's thinking. And he managed to bring American around to this idea gently in small stages during the war as he would reiterate how important America's alliances were Folks, uh, we're experiencing some technical difficulties with Dr. Brands. If you could just stay with us. We know he is uh, frozen on the screen and we will get back to him in just a few seconds. So please uh, bear with us. Okay, so he's gonna create an inter he's gonna create a United Nations and he arranges a positive vote within the US Senate before the war is over. So it's really clear that the United States is not gonna do what it did after World War I, where Wilson, negotiated the basis for the League of Nations, and then the Senate rejected it when it was asked to ratify the Treaty of Versailles. Roosevelt made sure that everything was in order. He got his ducks in a row. The Senate preemptively, preemptively supported American participation in the United Nations. So this is one thing critical. A second thing is 
that Roosevelt recognizes that the United States is going to have to make accommodations to the Soviet Union. Now, he comes to this recognition early in 1945. It's very clear that the war in Europe is winding down. It's critical to Roosevelt's thinking that the Soviet Union at this point is not at war against Japan. All of Roosevelt's military and naval advisors say that it's entirely possible that the war against Japan, the war in the Pacific, could go on for six months, go on for a year after the end of the war in Europe. Roosevelt is still committed to the idea that it's Europe first, but once Germany is defeated, then America can turn its full power to the war in the Pacific. But he needs help, he wants help. Uh, is everything okay? I'm getting odd. Jeff, can you hear me okay? Dr. Brands, we can hear you just fine, but we may need to check your camera. You're, uh, you're on a black screen right now. Your audio is great. Hey, now we see you. Perfect. All right. Okay. Okay. So Roosevelt needs, believe he believes the United States needs Soviet help in ending the war against Japan. And so in his last summit conference with Churchill and Stalin at Yalta in, uh, in, on the Russian Black Sea coast, Roosevelt goes and he makes a deal with Stalin. And the deal is that the Soviet Union agrees that it will enter the war against Japan within 90 days of the end of the war against Hitler, against Germany. And for Roosevelt, this is quite a coup because Roosevelt understood perfectly well that the Soviet Red Army had borne most of the burden of fighting against Germany. Two thirds of all the soldiers who were killed in the European war were Soviet soldiers. So every Soviet soldier who died in the war against Germany was one less American soldier that might have to die. So Roosevelt recognized a debt that the United States owed to the Soviet Union and to the Red Army. And he was delighted to get Stalin's agreement that the Red Army would be employed against Japan within three months of the end of the war in, in Europe. It would take that long to pull the, the troops back from Germany and get them off to East Asia where they could confront the Japanese, potentially in Manchuria and elsewhere in China, even, even in an invasion of the Japanese home islands. So this is what Roosevelt wants, but to get Stalin's agreement, he has to make uh, a bargain. And part of the deal is that he tacitly accepts Stalin's dominance, the Soviet dominance of Poland at the end, uh, after the war. Now, the Soviets had good reason for fearing Germany, for an, fearing an invasion from the West. They remembered when Napoleon had invaded Russia in 1812 through Poland. He remembered when the Germans invaded Russia in World War I through Poland. And the Germans had invaded the Soviet Union in World War II through Poland. So it wasn't out of line for Stalin to insist on a dominant role in Poland. What, what Stalin really wanted was the opportunity to, to create Poland as a satellite country, a buffer state for the Soviet Union. And Roosevelt recognized that this was going to happen, whether the United States really opposed it or not. There were, the Red Army already controlled Poland. And what Roosevelt got Stalin to do was to agree on paper to democratic elections in Poland after the war. But Roosevelt understood, Stalin knew, everybody who really was paying attention recognized that democratic elections really weren't gonna do anything except elect candidates and off officials who were friendly to the Soviet position. Now, after the war was over, Roosevelt was criticized. Some people said that he conspired against Poland, that he committed treason at Yalta against Poland and American interests by allowing the Soviets to have this dominant role in Poland. Well, there are two things wrong with this argument. Number one is Roosevelt couldn't have done anything about it because the United States wasn't prepared and the American people certainly weren't prepared to continue marching from Germany into Poland and into the Soviet Union to throw the Russians out. That simply wasn't in the cards. The second thing was, and there's this argument is made in the hindsight of knowledge that the United States didn't end up needing Soviet help in Japan, uh, against Japan, because 
of the atom bomb. Now, when Roosevelt went to Yalta, when he devised his policies towards Stalin and the end of the war in the Pacific, he had no idea whether the atom bomb was going to work at all. It hadn't been tested. It, that can, the construction of the thing hadn't even been completed. So he didn't know if it was going to be completed on time. He didn't know if it would work once completed. He didn't know that it would be a usable military weapon. None of this stuff was known. And so Roosevelt went to Yalta, and Roosevelt came home from Yalta thinking that he had done a good thing for the United States. Now, Roosevelt died a few weeks after getting back from Yalta, and the, the, the horizon of international affairs changes dramatically once the United States tests the atom bomb in New Mexico in July 1945 because this holds out the promise that there, the United States is not going to need Soviet help in defeating Japan. And in fact, when Roosevelt went to Yalta, getting the Soviet Union into the war against Japan was crucial. It was the top of his list of priorities. Once the atom bomb is tested, then keeping the Soviet Union out of the war against Japan is not actually the top of his successor, Harry Truman's priorities, but it's an important consideration because there was a recognition that if the Soviet Union gets into the war against Japan, then the Soviet Union has a say in the way the peace settlement plays out in Asia. And so Harry Truman has to make a decision once the bomb is tested, do we actually use it? And he thought about it, he considered alternatives. Do we do a test? Do we do a demonstration on a deserted island somewhere? What are we gonna do? In later decades, Harry Truman would be criticized by many people for using this horrible weapon against Japan at a time when the Japanese were on the verge of surrender. Now, as a, as a matter of fact, Truman didn't know they were on the verge of surrender. In fact, it's quite arguable that they were not on the verge of surrender anyway, because indeed, when Truman gave the order to use the bomb, not one, but twice, the two bombs were dropped against Japan, and then the emperor gave the order to his military leaders to stand down. There was a mutiny in Japan against the emperor's order. So ending the war, even with the atom bomb, was not an automatic thing. Anyway, so the war does end in the middle of August, 1945. And what's left? What's left is to really do the work that Franklin Roosevelt thought had been important from the beginning, to create an international regime that would prevent a World War III. And the basis of this was the United Nations. So the United Nations would play the role that the League of Nations had not been allowed to play because the most powerful country in the world, the United Nations, had stayed out. Roosevelt insisted that the United States would be part of the United Nations. Harry Truman picked it up, and Harry Truman was the one who was president when the United States negotiated and signed the Charter of the United Nations. And the whole point of the United Nations was to prevent World War III. Now, the United Nations has existed these last 75 years. There has been no World War III. It would be facile to say that it was the United Nations that prevented World War III. But I'm going to argue that the United Nations was part of the Roosevelt scheme to end the war that has kept World War III from happening. If you put the question to most people, why no World War III? The, the answer that's given most commonly is because nuclear weapons exist and nuclear weapons make a modern general war so costly that no country, no leader in his right mind would use them. And therefore, the costs of war clearly will outweigh the benefits of war, therefore, no World War III. I'm not going to deny that that's part of it. But I would suggest that there are a couple of other things involved. One is the American commitment to the idea of collective action. Collective action is this, or collective security, it's this umbrella term that means that the United States conceives its interests as part of international interest. The United States is not this country alone. The United States is not the isolationist power it was in the 1920s and 1930s. The United States tried that in the 1920s and 30s, and the result was 
World War II. So Roosevelt says to himself that if we're gonna prevent World War III, the United States cannot step back. The United States needs to be continually engaged in world order, in keeping world order. And a centerpiece of this is the United Nations. Now, Roosevelt imagined, Roosevelt hoped that the United Nations could be this unified body of the great powers, the ones who the charter members of the Security Council, the ones who have a veto, that they would be able to resolve disputes about war. It turned out that things became more complicated. Roosevelt did not foresee the Cold War developing the way it did. He understood that the United States did not have interests that were identical with the Soviet Union by any means. He recognized that Hitler was the cement that held the Grand Alliance together. You kill Hitler and the Grand Alliance starts falling apart. Nonetheless, he did believe that the United States, Britain, the Soviet Union, you could throw in France and China, had sufficient interest in maintaining the peace that they could find a way through. It didn't work out that way. What the Cold War did was to break Roosevelt's idea of a single collective security into two competing versions of collective security. Collective security as it evolved in the Cold War on the American side started with NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the rest of America's military alliances around the world. But the essence of NATO was pretty much the same as the idea behind the League of Nations. And that is a guarantee by the United States, the most powerful country in the world, that if you attack one of our allies, it's the same as attacking us. And therefore, you won't attack one of our allies because you don't want to take us on. This was the idea behind the League of Nations. It was going to be the idea behind the United Nations. And it actually played out once, really, in the Korean War for an odd, out of an odd coincidence of events. And again, in the Persian Gulf War of 1990, but, but those are the anomalies. Instead, what the United States did was to rely on its own military alliance, it's sort of this, this halfway house of collective security. And the Soviet Union had its own halfway house of collective security in the Warsaw Pact. The other aspect, though, which I really haven't spoken about at all, but it was part of the League of Nations idea, and it really became part of America's thinking, this international thinking was the concept of free trade. The United States had not been a free trading country for most of its history. And during the interwar period, especially during the 1930s, the United States retreated behind tariff walls. But Roosevelt recognized that the tariff wars of the 1930s had been really important in establishing the adversarial mindset that gave rise to the actual war of the 1940s. So the tariff wars of the 1930s led to the, the big war of the 1940s. What the United States needed to do was to sign on to, to guarantee free trade, to make America's former enemies, its customers, its suppliers, to bring Japan, to bring Germany into this international regime where they had a stake in keeping things going. He originally imagined that this might include the Soviet Union, but the Soviets wanted nothing to do with the free trade of the capitalist West. So it's, it was kind of a half-hearted thing. But nonetheless, this idea that America's allies, America's partners, America's customers are part of this international regime and that the United States benefits from creating a robust international regime. It's not America first, the way the isolationists of the 1930s had said, it's America in conjunction with its allies. And this, I would argue, this idea of collective security and free trade, it's this approach to the world that says the United States is part of this international community. The United States needs to keep the international community healthy, prosperous, that has prevented World War III. So Roosevelt's idea of how the war should end, I would argue, lasted long outlasted the war and is a central reason why there hasn't been a World War III. Now, when I put the question to my students, they say, why has there been no World War III? Some of them eventually uh, come out, there's a, an adverb that needs to go to the end of that. Why no, why no World War III yet? If there is another war, then that part's sort of off the table. Anyway, so that's what I got to say. Let's hear if people have questions. Do we have any, Jeff? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Brands. That was quite incredible. Uh, I want to remind everybody here to please use your chat feature uh, to go ahead and type your questions in, and we'll get to them uh, here in just a, a minute. But in the meantime, sir, I do have a question for you. You mentioned you know, Japan attacking uh, Pearl Harbor, and of course, we uh, declare war on them on the 8th of December. Three days later, Germany declares war on us. It was kind of this perfect storm, uh, if you will, for what uh, FDR was kind of almost hoping would happen to, to get us included in a war that was inevitable, but not looking for a fight. Uh, so he had this Europe first 
policy. And it, I'm just curious as to your opinion and how well uh, he implemented that. The policy on paper was Europe first. And this was partly just strategic thinking within the United States along the lines I described earlier, that there was a recognition that Germany was a full scale great power in 1941. Japan was, uh, was not of that rank. The Japanese empire looked really impressive on a map. If you drew all the area in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia that was controlled by the Japanese, but most of it was empty. That is, it was ocean. And the Japanese army was already sort of up to its neck and bogged down in China. So it was pretty clear by 1941 that the Japanese were not going to defeat China. China was simply too big. And the longer the Japanese fought in China, the more bogged down they were going to get. So the critical thing in the early phase, uh, in early 1942, was to keep the Japanese from expanding much farther. And that's why the battles of Midway and Coral Sea were critical. So interestingly, although, and maybe this might get at your implementation part of the question, the strategy of the United States was Europe first, but in fact, the most important early fighting took place in the Pacific and precisely at these battles. And this, this because in American military and naval history, the Navy has always been ready to go when the war breaks out, or at least it can get ready really quickly. The Army takes a long time. The United States from the Revolutionary War era has always had this phobia about standing armies. I should say, always had this phobia about standing armies. And there was a belief that the oceans surrounding the United States are wide. And okay, we declare war. Well, if it takes us four months to rev up for a war, to call out the militia, to train them, get them ready, then no big deal. Nothing is gonna happen of importance during that four month window. And so this is why, in, for example, the Spanish-American War. The United States declares war in April, but American troops you know, don't start fighting until the middle of the summer. And, but the world moved more slowly then. However, Theodore Roosevelt, who was an early advocate of the strong Navy, recognized you can't build ships on a moment's notice. You have to build those ahead of time. So when the war began in the Pacific, and I, I guess I should add one other thing, that Roosevelt had a potential political problem selling Europe first because Germany had not launched this sneak attack against the United States and Japan had. So if Americans are feeling a need for revenge or you know, getting back at the country that attacked the United States, they're pushing in the direction of Japan. So Roosevelt has to do something and he can because he has the ships in the Pacific. Now it's, it's a well-known story about how in some ways uh, as tragic as it was for the people who were killed and wounded at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese attack really did the United States a favor by forcing the United States to rely on the new modern weaponry of aircraft carriers. Everybody before Pearl Harbor thought the next war was gonna be fought with battleships, the way the last war had been fought. And once the Japanese gutted the heart of America's battleship fleet at Pearl Harbor, the United States had no alternative except to go with the aircraft carriers, which turned out to be the, the winning weapon in the Pacific. So during the first six months of American involvement in the fight, so from December 8th, as you say, um, 1941, until December 1942, there's essentially nothing going on in Europe. When Americans pick up the newspapers in the morning, they read headlines about what's happening in the Pacific. And what the United States did in the first six months was to hold the line. And once the Japanese were stopped at Midway, once they were stopped Coral Sea, then it was almost like this balloon that had, had expanded and expanded and now could no longer expand. And there was thinking that turned out to be true that if the Japanese weren't expanding, they were gonna to have to contract. And so the, the battle against the Japanese, sort of the, the slog across the Pacific, really began by the summer of 1942, but it didn't get first call on American resources. Because by the summer of 1942, Americans were gearing up for the invasion of North Africa. This was in the European theater. So the second reason for the emphasis on Europe, the first reason was that it, was, it simply matched the strategic thinking of American planners. The second reason, this is no less important, was it was the part of the war that was necessary 
to keep Stalin and Churchill on board. Now, Roosevelt recognized that the United States was fighting as part of, a, part of an alliance. And he recognized that the British Navy was absolutely crucial to success in the war and that access to the British homeland in time it would be called the equivalent of an unsinkable aircraft carrier, just 25 miles off the coast of Europe. This was crucial for American success against Germany. The second thing was, and this is the thing that really haunted Roosevelt nights, and that was the possibility of a separate peace between Hitler and Stalin, because the two dictators had had an alliance, a non-aggression pact from 1939. And it was only when Hitler double-crossed Stalin in the summer of 1941 that Germany went to war against the Soviet Union. Germany invaded the Soviet Union and didn't deliver the knockout punch. And so it would have been in keeping with Hitler's cynical approach to policy to declare a truce with the Soviet Union. And that would be absolutely disastrous because it would free up all of those German divisions to come and defend the Atlantic Wall in the West where the United States is gonna invade. So it was absolutely central to Roosevelt's thinking that the Soviet Union has to be given enough encouragement from the United States to keep fighting. And as I said earlier, it turned out to be the Red Army more than anything else that defeated the Soviet, assuming they defeated German Wehrmacht. It was the Russians who did all the fighting and Roosevelt understood perfectly well, better that they're fighting in Russia than that they move to the West and American troops have to fight them. So the policy was Europe first, but the way it played out in practice was the Pacific first, then back to Europe, and then finally back to the Pacific. Interesting. Uh, we've got time for just uh, one more question, Dr. Okay. Brands. This is from Dr. Jim Galdino. Uh, he's asking to discuss the differences between uh, Roosevelt and Truman's post-war vision, uh, the power of the military influence in the government. With Truman seems extraordinary, uh, if Roosevelt lived, would he have handled that Soviet expansionism differently, or did we misread Soviet intent? So this is something that historians have been debating ever since. It's, it's what we historians do. We, we argue. And we argue about things where you can't actually come up with a final answer. So the way I read it is this. There were structural elements of American relations with the Soviet Union that were going to be the same regardless of who was running the United States, Roosevelt or Truman, who was running the Soviet Union. Stalin could have died too. In fact, he did die in 1953, and things didn't change all that much. So the structural part of it was that at the end of the war, 1945, the United States and the Soviet Union were the two giants who had been allied during the war, but they had been allied only by their mutual enmity against Nazi Germany. Germany is defeated, and it is a basic principle of international affairs that the number one power in the world and the number two power in the world, the United States in this case and the Soviet Union, begin to eye each other skeptically. So regardless of who's running the show in these two countries, there's going to be a certain level of distrust. Now, if Roosevelt had lived, and let's suppose Roosevelt had lived in a healthy fashion, so he had been, been strong enough to actually stamp American post-war policy with his personality. I do believe that Roosevelt would have done better at handling relations with Stalin. Stalin understood Roosevelt. Stalin respected Roosevelt. He was somebody who had been through the war with Stalin and who could speak. Stalin could speak candidly to him. Now, Roosevelt's critics would say, that Stalin pulled the wool over Roosevelt's eyes. Nobody pulled the wool over Franklin Roosevelt's eyes. He could be as cynical as the next person in understanding the motives of the people that he was working with. But the thing is that Roosevelt in 1945 had nothing to prove. He didn't have to demonstrate his decisiveness. He didn't have to demonstrate his toughness. Harry Truman did. Harry Truman was a nobody. Nobody had ever heard of Harry Truman, really, when he became president of the United States. And Truman had to demonstrate that from being nobody, he was the equal of somebody like Franklin Roosevelt. And so Truman really went out of his way to be confrontational toward the Soviet Union. And when the Soviets did something that might have been interpreted in a way of simply, oh, maybe a little bit of probing here, Truman cracked down and said, okay, this is something that is a serious threat to world peace. Roosevelt, that wasn't Roosevelt's style. Now, Truman, while he was president, and for decades after, was seen as really mishandling American Cold War policy. When he left the White House in 1953, he was the most unpopular president ever. He was more unpopular 
than Richard Nixon at the depths of Watergate when he resigned in 1974. It's only later that his political stock began to rise. So, and so eventually the war ended, the Cold War ended, excuse me, the Cold War ended on Harry Truman's terms. And so Harry Truman gets some recognition for that. I, what I would say is, first of all, Roosevelt wouldn't have been president forever anyway, even if he had lived out his fourth term. By 1940, the end of 1948, he's gone. And the Cold War doesn't really heat up until after that. So if Roosevelt had lived for another three and a half years, those three and a half years might have been somewhat different, but the next 25 or 30 years, the, the balance of the Cold War probably would have been rather similar to what it was. Excellent. So, uh, sir, we've got a ton of questions that we have coming in from our panelists. Do you suggest, is there a way that they could uh, contact you individually, or do you uh, suggest uh, one of your books that, that covers this topic in, in greater detail? Well, since you asked, I wrote a book called Traitor to His Class. It's a biography of Franklin Roosevelt, and it deals very much with this. I also have a book uh, on Harry Truman and the Korean War. It's called The General Versus the President. The general is Douglas MacArthur, hero of World War II, who becomes a very controversial figure during the Korean War. So I, I deal with these issues in those two books. And of course, the listeners can feel free to email me. I'm at the University of Texas. So if you just go to the website for the University of Texas, you can find me there. The, the address, if anybody's writing it down is, or maybe you can post it. It's hwbrands at austin.university. Dot, show me, HW Brands at austin.utexas.edu. So feel free to share that with uh, the viewers. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, on behalf of all of our participants and all of us here at the National Museum Pacific World, we really thank you for your time, Dr. Brands. That was really uh, quite a wonderful lecture. And now, if you could, folks, uh, stand by. We're going to have Miss Christine Hicks, our curator of collections. She's going to join us here in the studio. Uh, but to uh, abide by our regulation of social distancing, give us just a minute. She will come into the set and I will be leaving. So st uh, stick around for Miss Christine Hicks. Hi, um, I'm Christine Hicks here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. And I'm here to introduce to you an exhibit that we've been working on called Four Freedoms, a 21st century interpretation. This exhibit will be on display in our temporary gallery uh, from October 2nd, 2020 to April 18th, 2021. So this exhibit is actually a showcase of art. Uh, we are inviting children from the US and abroad uh, between the ages of 12 and 18 to submit their artwork uh, showing their interpretation of one of the four freedoms. Uh, if you don't know, uh, the four freedoms was introduced by FDR and his State of the Union Address on January 6, 1941. These four freedoms uh, are freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Uh, more details on this contest, submission rules, uh, and also the philosophies behind the four freedoms uh, all can be found on our website at www pacificwarmuseum.org. You will go up to the right hand corner under the events tab and click on any of the calendar pages that says uh, Four Freedoms, a 21st Century Interpretation Submission. Um, you will find all the details that you need and um, I'm excited to see some of your artwork. However, I know with the coronavirus that uh, art supplies and a trip to the store is not a priority for your family. However, I have found uh, in my own work that you can use anything around your house as part of your art. Um, I, for example, I did my own version of this project. Um, this is my Freedom From Fear. Um, so for example, uh, one of the requirements we have uh, is that all art come to us ready to hang if we choose you for the art show. Um, so what I did instead of going out and buying a hanger or uh, going out and buying wire or having it professionally framed, um, I just got some old fabric, uh, made a little loop and glued it to the back. 
Uh, old fabric can be used for your artwork. Um, I have used nail polish, beading from old jewelry, uh, pieces of CDs that I cut up, aluminum foil. Uh, there are various things you can use around your house to create artwork and not make you go out of your house. So you can still stay at home and do your artwork. Uh, yeah, so I hope to uh, see all of your submissions. I'm excited. And yeah, I would love to see what your interpretations of these freedoms are. So thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I hope you look for our next uh, webinar series, which will be on the 13th of May at 1 p.m., where we will be joined by Mr. Jim Hornfisher. And his topic will be Revelation and Reckoning, Total War in the Pacific, 1944 to 1945. Thank you again, and we hope to see you next time.